space. I reckon that's a lonely place to call home for two travel-weary bluegrass astronauts. But between the long shifts of fishing for hydrocarbon and the lakes of Saturn's moon Titan, there's just enough time to get some picking in. So hush up your mug and fetch a jug of lunar shine while you can join us in the loneliest honky-tonk this side of the Appalachian supercluster. By God, here she is a cop. New transmission of podcast with Marcel, featuring Hayes Griffin. Hey, Marcel, I'm starting to get a little worried about JD. Uh, what's up? I just came back from the engine room, and JD is running around beating the hull of the ship with what looks like a goat skin. Oh, sounds like JD is just celebrating Lupercalia. I feel a nerd rant coming. Lupercalia is an ancient Roman festival where people would run naked through the streets, striking one another with strips of animal skin. Its original name, Februa, is where the name of the month comes from. Stop! That still doesn't explain why our bartender bot is celebrating an ancient Roman holiday. Some scholars consider Lupercalia to be the basis for Valentine's Day. This is a long shot, but maybe JD is in love? <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? JD, are you in love? Not at all. Well, I'll take that as a big old yes. Stop crying, Hayes. JD doesn't kiss and tell. Whatever. I'm headed back to the engine room to clean up JD's mess. Marcel, come quick. What is it? Is the osmium dorsal offline? Do we need to completely resynchronize the plasma core? Never mind all that. Look at what's written on the theramagnetic chroniton propeller housing. I can't believe it. JD plus antique. Yeah, me neither. JD has gotten way better with a paintbrush. No, JD is in love with the ship. Maybe we should talk about this, uh, this ship stuff. You know, what we saw in the engine room. Maybe let's uh, talk about that when JD's not right here. <laughs> I think that's probably a good idea because no joke, I'm a little freaked out, but we'll make it through. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's Valentine's Day, you know. I'm. It is Valentine's Day, or Lupercalia, which kind of has me thinking about something else. Nope, no way you can use that as a segue. That would be way too impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Lupercalia, <laughs> kind of specific. Go ahead. What were you gonna say? <laughs> yeah, um, Lupercalia, the beginning of Valentine's Day, a storied tradition of running through the streets naked, hitting people with goat skins and promoting fertility and prosperity in the coming year. Just like we do today. N nothing screams bluegrass like that, right? <laughs> 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 and when I think of Lupercalia and its evolution into Valentine's Day, it makes me think of just troubled love in general. Bluegrass itself has had a long troubled history with love, I believe, from the very beginning and has evolved quite a bit. So just I was going to ask Marcel, what's your favorite bluegrass love song? Oh, oh, uh, probably a little girl of mine in Tennessee. Ah, perfect choice. You have fallen directly into my trap. Sounds like the boys might be talking about some bluegrass history. I am so glad, Marcel, that you brought up little girl of mine in Tennessee because we are going straight back to the first generation of bluegrass with this one, right? Yeah, let's do it. So, Flat and Scruggs, an amazing tune, right? Did it actually, did they write that one? Well, I think if you look up the songwriter info, it'll say one of their wives, but yes, I think they wrote it. Yes. <laughs> For legal reasons. The, yes, uh, that's another episode. Oh, that's God. That's a, a whole other episode, yeah. <laughs> that is a whole other episode. But it's interesting when you start to dive through the first generation of bluegrass in terms of love songs, right? You know, if we look at Bill Monroe and the acts associated with Bill Monroe the, in that first generation, we get songs like Little Girl of Mine in Tennessee, which is kind of sort of a love song, right? Yeah, it like involves love. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, also a lot of talk about like, man, if I ever go back there, she'll be there. But like, I'm probably not going back. Yeah. And I feel like every time I my head starts bopping and I'm like, oh, this is such a beautiful love song. You know, my little girl of mine in Tennessee. And you start to listen to the lyrics. You're just like, huh? You know? <laughs> and, and there are kind of four or five, three or four actually themes that, that seem to pop up where it's like love is involved, mm -hmm. right? But then it kind of gets steered into the ditch some other way. And I think you just touched on one of them, the, the kind of... Uh, 
leaving longing category is as I describe it in my mind. Would you say that that's an accurate kind of category of bluegrass song? Yeah, totally. There's a lot that kind of talk about that. For some reason, they can't be together, but uh, they obviously love each other very much. There's a, a Monroe tune called I'm Waiting For You that is the same kind of thing. It's, you know, like maybe not one of his hits. There are a million tunes like that, though. On my way back to the old home, you know, like I've been mm -hmm. away and now I'm coming back, you know, all of this like leaving home kind of thing. And as I start to like kind of get a vision of love songs in my mind from Bluegrass, there are positive love songs, like actual love songs, but I was only like literally able to find like two or three that I could consider <laughs> like a good woman's love. That's a Monroe tune. Yeah. That's like actually like, you know, a, a good woman's love made a new man of me. That's like a positive message. There still in love, at least in the context of the song. But then we kind of get to some other categories like body and soul, the Monroe tune, death. Oh yeah. I loved her so much, but now she's dead. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> like we can't, guys, you you, ha you were so close, you know? Yeah, <laughs> you right. almost had a good one. Monroe's kind of interesting too, because he's got like, it depends on the period, because he's got these real like saccharine kind of love songs sometimes. He's like a crooner, bluegrass period, you know? Yeah. Not that Bill was really one of those guys, but like that period did exist. 100%. Yeah, it's weird that I associate that with like a genuine love song. Like maybe when you think of the word crooner, you think like Rat Pack, you think like Dean Martin or something. And it's like everybody loves somebody, you know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, and that's not what Bill did in that time period. They're still like very dramatically oversung kind of songs, but they're like miserable songs, you know? <laughs> oh, like it, it pulls you to a dark place like <laughs> instantaneously. It's that it's that whole kind of weird juxtaposition that exists in bluegrass, which is almost where I'm headed with this, where the song itself, if you're just listening to the chord changes and and Kenny Baker playing a fiddle solo on it, you're like, wow, that's a peppy little tune there. And as soon as you start to pay attention to the lyrics, it's like the, it goes straight into the ditch, you know, um, <laughs> which kind of steers me to my last like the last category of tune that I kind of think about when I, it comes to bluegrass love songs, because we are so obsessed with this. And I think it has something directly to do with the father of bluegrass himself, the cheating lost love category of mm. songs in bluegrass, yes. w of which there are 20 million Mm, is that a little Georgia Rose? I feel like it's, it's maybe a little implied that there's something. Yeah, right. The ones that I have are, are like Highway of Sorrow. That's the I like Highway of Sorrow because that's one where the narrator admits to being the cheater. Yeah. You know, and it's a Monroe tune. We'll get back to that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But but you have tunes like Cabin of Love you know, Cabin of Love, where where the narrator is the victim. I don't even think I know that one. Uh, yeah, Dreamed of a Cabin of Love, Dear. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll check that one out later. Listening sesh, right after. <laughs> <laughs> um, or Sweetheart, You've Done Me Wrong. Even the title of that one's, like, pretty self-explanatory, right? This is, like, in, in all these ones that I'm listing, by the way, are Monroe tunes. We haven't even dipped into any other songwriters or, or first-generation players here. Well, what else do you need, Hayes? I don't think you do need anything else, to be quite honest. I seriously, and this is this brings me back to my point about Highway of Sorrow. And I know that you are a little bit of a scholar of, of Bill Monroe. You've probably read his biography, Can't You Hear Me Callin'? Have you checked that one out? Of course. Yeah. Required reading for, for anyone out there. I don't know about you, but when I read that book, there are a number of things that popped out to me about Bill Monroe's biography. Spoiler alerts. Here, <laughs> Bill Monroe had lots of mistresses. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's like, and and I think the author of "Can't You Hear Me Calling" kind of treats that subject pretty gingerly. Cuts Monroe a lot of slack and builds a narrative that's kind of like Bill Monroe did have a lot of mistresses, but he's a good guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I think we kind of we 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 straddle that line yeah. throughout the entire book. Right. It's it's just like, you know, well, he may have have had, you know, extramarital affairs. But Monroe, remember, he was a he was, you know, his mother died when he was 10 and his dad died when he was 16 and and he was abandoned and all this kind of stuff. I, in my opinion, Richard kind of paints that type of character of Monroe. Would you, would you agree? I mean, also about Richard. 
he, even though when we read it, we feel like, wow, he's cutting Bill a lot of slack. I mean, he got he got a lot of trash about what he exposed about Bill Monroe. There was a lot of backlash about, like, you shared too much, buddy. Roast. And you can see in his writing that he's trying to be careful about it. But he wasn't going to lie. He wasn't going to be like, none of that ever happened. Like, it's it so much of it is just public knowledge. Absolutely. And, and that's, I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to touch on that. When I read that book, I had already heard so many personal anecdotes of friends and former band members of Monroe about walking onto the bus and there being two teenage girls like rubbing his shoulders and rubbing his feet and this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and I even found this Mandolin Cafe article that I think was a good kind of secondary source to that that biography. Bill Graham, a mandolin player and like writer and photographer, wrote kind of a reaction in defense of Richard Smith uh, in 2009. So this was like eight years after the book comes out and Richard completely gets roasted, like you say. Yeah. Um, uh, Tom Ewing. Our, our local Columbus, Ohio bluegrass boy came out in stark opposition to the facts and narratives put forward in Can't You Hear Me Calling. Really? You had like a local public backlash. Yeah. And, and in fact, Ewing, who was, you know, you, you've probably seen Tom because he played with Monroe during like the Southern Flavor era and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It, it's kind of interesting because he does write his own biography of Bill Monroe. And Tom is a former high school teacher, very academic kind of guy. And I think he was like, let's stick to the facts here. He wanted to talk about the music and, and that kind of thing. Whereas Richard Smith was trying to, I think as a biographer, maybe should look at the whole person. Well, so much of it is influenced by the experience. I mean, so much of the songs Bill wrote and the choices he made financially and, and in how his business was run is directly influenced by his mistresses. You literally, you if you cut it out, there's just a gaping hole in the story and you're like, what goes here? Yeah, it's like, well, how did Bill's mandolin get all smashed up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> Or like, why did Bill take these gigs at like festivals? Well, we'll talk about it, you know? Like there was a certain woman who talked him into doing it, who who like basically was like an in-between for like Rinsler to talk to Monroe, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like it wasn't Monroe who got that deal. No, not at all. I mean, there are just so many, an overwhelming number of scenarios that people have put forth that it's undeniable that the man had lots of relationships with lots of women. And as I think about like Richard Smith's kind of narrative in the book, I think about Tom Ewing's reaction, a former band member and stuff. I, I don't think we necessarily need to see Bill Monroe as like, you know, this like evil womanizer dude. But it, it does make me think about, have you heard of attachment theory or attachment styles? Psychologists talk about this Please all the time. Please educate me. Yeah. <laughs> so I know this is like, wait, where are we going? There's this guy named John Bowlby invents this attachment theory thing in the late 1960s where... Bullet, you know, long story short, he thinks that early childhood experiences have way more to do with how we act and treat other people as adults than we initially thought, you know? So, mm -hmm. so if something traumatic happens with a parent or you're not given enough, you know, kind of attention or love from a parent, that can manifest in like really specific kind of ways, according to him. And there's this one... Um, Attachment style, it stuck out to me, bold face, when I read this, man. Fearful, avoidant attachment style. Check this out. Fearful, avoidant attachment can lead to behavior that may be confusing to friends and romantic partners. People with this style may encourage closeness at first and then emotionally or physically retreat when they start to feel vulnerable in the relationship. Fearful, avoidant attachment styles are prone to having a large number of romantic partners in their life. <laughs> oh. And fearful avoidant often believe that they are unlovable because of some sort of gap in their childhood, the loss of a loved one or a mother or father that didn't exactly give them warm, caring attention. Mm -hmm. So I heard it in your voice. If you know anything about Bill Monroe's biography, like I said, <laughs> mom dies at 10, dad dies at 16. All of his brothers and sisters move away because he's the youngest one, right? That's why he got mm -hmm. stuck with the mandolin. He was the last one in line. So I guess where I'm steering this is that I think Bill Monroe was like a traumatized individual that never kind of received any sort of therapeutic catharsis in his life. And maybe that was like 
his his womanizing and all of these things were maybe some somehow related to his early childhood. So what you're setting up is like how to build a brand new Bill Monroe. These events happen in your childhood and it leads you to, you know, date a bunch of women, have a bunch of mistresses and stuff, and then you write all of the very interesting songs. Brilliant, Hayes. Mm, I'm not sure we should actually do that. I, I feel like that's a little, well, I'm not gonna say the word, but that's that's bad science, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's absolutely bad science, but it do, it makes you kind of think about it, though, doesn't it? When you see the data that's kind of put forward in the Bill Monroe narrative, oh, yeah. I'm not saying that, like, I'm not making a psychological diagnosis or whatever, but to me, it's kind of like the reason that people got so upset when that narrative was put forward by Richard Smith. They got so upset because people tend to see things as black and white. Bill Monroe was my hero. He's the father of bluegrass. He's this amazingly positive force. Or... Bill Monroe was a womanizer. He was this terrible individual that, you know, kind of ran rampant with his romantic relationships and stuff. But to me, it's kind of like when I see things like these attachment theories and stuff like that, it allows me to kind of step back and see Bill Monroe maybe as a more complete individual than if you were just to kind of read this binary argument yeah. that people want to give on this thing. You know, I've seen people do that at jams and stuff where they're like, oh, Bill Monroe. Yeah, he's great. We have to love him. He invented all this. Or they're like, oh, Bill Monroe, he's the worst, you know. And uh, yeah, I always felt strange about that. That neither one of those is the truth. Neither one of those is what actually happened. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's something inherently empathy inducing about thinking about someone from the perspective of their childhood to me, because I think a lot of important stuff does happen early on in life like that, whether or not you believe in this like attachment theory kind of thing. I think it's reasonable to say that if something bad happens to you early in life, that's going to maybe stay with you for a while for sure. and manifest in some way. To put a bow on that, Bill Monroe, fearful avoidant attachment style, leads to amazingly complex, ridiculous love songs that we are still talking about 70 years later. It's like, why did you go into the ditch, Bill? Why did you go into the ditch? He was a fearful avoidant attachment style. That's why. <laughs> Do you think we should be concerned that JD is in love with the antique? Nah, he's fine. It's Lupercalia. Love is in the air, along with the smell of goat hide. Did you know that in Finland and Estonia, Valentine's Day is actually called Ustavan Paiva or Friends Day? You're for sure pronouncing that wrong, and we're not celebrating Friends Day. Well, then I suppose you don't want this gift JD and I got you. And what I meant was, we're not celebrating Friends Day unless we exchange gifts. That's what I thought. All right, JD, bring it out. Coming right up. Oh my God. Is that what I think it is? My own tricorder? Hold it. One, Star Trek is not real. We've been over this. Two, this is a standard issue Monroe Corporation monocorder, which is legally distinct from Star Trek and part of our fictional canon, not Star Trek's. I love it. But wait a sec, where did you even find this thing? Remember how JD was bludgeoning the ship with a goat skin earlier? A panel shook loose during his episode. I found this and some other doodads tucked in there. Weird. Because I put my Esteban papaya gift for you behind a panel in the engine room. What a coincidence. Let me just grab that right quick. Gotta find a gift, gotta find a gift. Hopefully there's something good in this box. Whoa, this is a duo quarter. That's one entire quarter better than yours. Thanks, Marcel. Yeah, I, I only needed the one quarter anyway. I bet I can use this to talk to other ships. You got your ears on out there? This is Space Cowboy. I got a few gumball machines on my tail and I'd like to make it out here shiny side up. Come on back. I want to talk like Smokey and the Bandit. Voice interface activated. This ship can talk? I have so many questions. Yeah, yeah, it's me, the ship. I've been here the whole time. Leave it to a couple of carbon fishermen wannabe bluegrass astronauts to never read the manual. By the way, the panel in the engine room is a training station for new recruits. You'd both have known that if you'd finished the orientation VHS. And your standard issue mono and dual quarters can hail other ships, but you need to hold down the talk button. Lastly, JD isn't in love with me. He wants to interface with my computer. I think to access drink recipes and base tabs, literally all that guy talks about is bartending and base. Whoa, we have a VCR? I'm gonna go watch my tapes. So I guess this means we can just talk to the ship whenever we want, right? I guess. Ship, report. All systems nominal, no anomalies detected. I don't think that'll ever get old, I like that now. I kinda like that too. This is a great day, I'll never forget Lupercalia. 
Anyway, so you were saying earlier, you were talking about Bill Monroe. Yeah, I want to talk about not Bill Monroe. I want to talk about someone who was by Bill Monroe's side for a long time, maybe a surprisingly long time. But this this is a story about the woman who had had the second longest tenure as a bluegrass boy. She was also one of Bill's mistresses and kind of his wife, even though they never got married. And she also divorced him, even though there was no marriage license. It's an incredible story. <laughs> Set up straight and get ready for a bluegrass history lesson. This is about Bessie Lee Malden. Ah. And I found out that I'd been mispronouncing her last name for a long time. I wanted to point that out in case anyone else does that. I. I think it was a friend of mine who, who first told me about her, and he said Bessie Lee Maudlin, ah. um, but the L is in a different spot. So if, you, if you're saying that last name wrong, let me, let me help you out right there. Don't be like me. So yeah, she was, I, I mean, she was right there at the foundation of Bluegrass. She was actually there, you know, like a decade or so earlier. You might call her the first like professional woman bluegrass bass player or just bluegrass musician in general. I don't think anyone can beat her to that claim because she was right there next to Bill, literally in his band. Yeah. Kind of remarkable, incredible, also in a band called the Bluegrass Boys and Bessie's up there playing bass, wild. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll get I'll get into the nitty gritty later, but just to give you an idea of what you know she did her time around Bill, um, she was one of the Bluegrass Boys kind of officially from 1953 to 1964. She might have played gigs on either side of that, you know, not on a regular basis, but she was a regular member in that time period. And she played bass on 35 Monroe recording sessions. Um, which is 111 separate cuts. So no other <laughs> bluegrass boy contributed to that many recordings except for Kenny Baker. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you think about like the, the next person to compare her to in Monroe's band is the man himself, Kenny Baker, right? That's yeah, funny. Yeah. No one else did that much work uh, except for Kenny Baker. She was also like super handy and apparently she could like repair anything. And she was also super uh, mischievous and kind of adventurous. So this led to her driving the boys and also like, or sometimes just navigating for the boys of like repairing the cars or finding new cars. Um, she was super useful and she ended up being sort of Bill's manager for a long time too. Basically, a lot of this history wouldn't have happened without her. And she's really just remembered as like mistress and not band manager, which is super disappointing. I'm actually really glad to, for you to say that because no joke, Marcel, that's what I had her categorized in my mind first two i'll admit that and that's it is terrible yeah because when you look at the volume of work that she put out in his band it's like she should have been at least the the heading two font under bill monroe you know what i mean <laughs> definitely yeah yeah and true if you're if you're thinking like well whatever she played bass like bluegrass bass isn't that hard no you can listen to her bass cuts like she she does like walks in between chords she does walking bass on occasion because bill had walking bass in his band. And and she plays in all kinds of like not easy keys, you know, like bluegrass bass is really easy in like the key of A, but like Bessie plays in B flat. There's recordings of her playing in like A flat too, like bizarro keys. So she knew what she was doing. She's no slouch on the bass. Let's get into the gross stuff. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a little bit of hearsay, depending on your sources for when they first met. But Bessie Lee could have met Bill Monroe as early as 1936. She would have been 16 years old. And this is at her high school in Norwood, North Carolina. And Bessie Lee was the winner of a school contest for selling the most Monroe Brothers tickets for a show because the Monroes were performing at her like high school auditorium. I, I don't I don't know any more information, but I assume part of the prize for selling the most tickets was like getting to meet the Monroe brothers, which would have been Bill. And that would have been her first time meeting him when she was 16. Officially, <laughs> officially they meet not long after Bill marries his first wife, Carolyn. Okay. And later on uh, in court proceedings, Bessie says, that on or about September 1941, she was lured by Bill from her home and family in Norwood, North Carolina. So Bessie would have been around 21 or 22 when she was lured away by Bill. Huh. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> interesting word choice to say in court, right? Huh, yeah. This is when we start exposing some of Bill's tendencies because Bill keeps his marriage to Carolyn secret from Bessie and from her family. As in, this means Bill is like seeing her 
in North Carolina. And it's like, oh, come back to Nashville with me. It's going to be a great time. And she does. She up and relocates back to Nashville. And, like, eventually it slips. Like, oh, Bill's married. That's where he goes every night. He goes home to his family. Or maybe he doesn't, you know. But yikes, right? You relocated oh. your whole life just to find out this dude's married. That's awful. <laughs> yeah. I think that was a little bit of a controlling move that Bill would pull. You know, if we're, if we're not pulling any punches, if we're going to say it like it is, I think Bill was bringing these women back to Nashville and then kind of being like, well, now you can't leave. Man, the funny thing is, I, I hate to steer back into that thing, but that also seems to be kind of a hallmark of <laughs> fearful avoidant attachment people. <laughs> like, I believe The it. manipulation of others to to love them and to like, you know, really go to lengths to kind of like have yeah. a lot of, oh man. <laughs> <laughs> So this is from Can't You Hear Me Calling, the book we were just talking about. In September 1941, Bill brought Bessie to Nashville and installed her in a hotel. She became his road girlfriend. The pattern was the same for years. The Bluegrass Boys would start to leave town. Bill would stop at a payphone and make a call. Bessie would then meet them at a designated pickup spot to join them for the trip. Meanwhile, Carolyn was keeping their house and Bill's books, keeping family and business together, and the arrangement worked for a long time because Bill was spending a lot of time on the road. But Carolyn knew full well what was going on. So Carolyn knows that she's being cheated on, but she's fairly certain that Bill won't leave her because Bill is a religious man and Carolyn's father is a preacher. And Bill is worried that he's going to get beat up, essentially. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or worse. (laughs) So whenever Carolyn would show up at these shows or like go to see Bill perform or whatever, he had like handlers that would hide Bessie, literally hide her. So she'd like get pushed into a closet or something so Carolyn wouldn't find her. Which means that though Bill was married to Carolyn, the, you know, sort of the love interest of Bill Monroe that was with him the most when he put together the famous lineup, the 1945 lineup, um, was Bessie. She was there for, like, the founding of Bluegrass, where we have, like, the Earl Scruggs and Lester Flatt lineup that everyone talks about, right? What's interesting about that is that at the same time that that's happening, Bessie is leaving Bill for another man. She's leaving him for a guy named Nelson Gann. This is such hot news with the Bluegrass Boys that they all know Nelson's name. They know about this guy. And the Bluegrass Boys were super worried that because Nelson Gann was some kind of, like, police officer or something... And their touring limo says Bill Monroe and his Bluegrass Boys on the oh. side. That at some point they're going to get like pulled over and Bill's going to get shot, right? Like they're worried that there's going to be like explosive uh, consequences because of this. Bill Monroe, of course, is like, oh, I'm going to get Bessie back. Meanwhile, Bill's like having kids with Carolyn and stuff. He's got like a, you know, quote unquote normal life over there. But he's like, oh, I got to get, you know, got to get Bessie Lee back. And Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill. So... Carolyn is is totally sick of that, you know, interaction. She hates this thing that's going on. And uh, here's another snippet from Can't You Hear Me Colin. Carolyn knew of Bill's relations with Bessie, and now she was obviously aware that their affair had been renewed. One night, out at the Monroe farm, the situation exploded. Carolyn had played the long-suffering wife long enough. She quarreled with Bill all night through and well into the early morning hours. After a time, Bill probably just started ignoring her. That was his pattern when he got angry, not to lash out physically or even verbally, but to ignore people, to shut them out of his life. But after the pain and humiliation of Bill's blatant long-term affair with Bessie, Carolyn was not to be denied. She blew up, grabbed an ice pick, and stabbed him in the leg. Bill stumbled out of the house, stopped his bleeding, and escaped into town. He checked into a hotel and there wrote one of his earliest and most compelling autobiographical, or as he called them, true songs, along about daybreak. Yeah, wild. (laughs) He's he's bleeding out through his leg from an ice pick wound, and he writes that too. Which is like, kind of makes me mad, because it feels like... It feels like Bill won that. Bill should lose this argument. Instead, he's like, I'm just going to go write a hit song. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I see that perspective. <laughs> it's a total, a total cop out. Maybe, maybe an avoidant style of, you know, <laughs> dealing with. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. <laughs> with conflict. Huh? Oh, God. <laughs> So the neat thing about all of this, about this, like, you know, Carolyn and Bill and then Bill and Bessie and then Bessie and Nelson is that everyone was aware of all this drama and this whole, like, you know, complicated love situation, depending on who you listen to, you know, by some accounts, this Nelson Gann thing and this Bessie and Bill thing 
is the reason that Earl Scruggs and Lester Flatt quit Bill's band. Yeah, February of 1948, right, when it's going down. Oh, man. I never heard it spun that way, you know what I mean? I always heard it spun the, like, Louise Scruggs and Earl Scruggs kind of, like, businessy kind of way, you know what I mean? Like, Well, yeah, the, but... the commentary about the Bluegrass Boys being worried that they'd get shot by Nelson... That's from a conversation with Earl Scruggs. Earl's the one who hinted at that. That's great. And can't you hear me calling it does say that Lester Flatt did not talk about the Nelson and Bessie situation at home, but that Earl did. I think that's what it says in the book. Yeah. That, that is possibly part of the reason that they left because it was just too much drama. So the crazy thing is in February of 1948, Earl and Lester are like, hey, we're quitting this band. We're out. And unknown to Bill, uh, Bessie leaves him that same month, right? She like... <laughs> So if if, the, if Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs are leaving because, you know, this Bessie situation is so annoying and Bill's like, no, you guys leave. I'm going to stay with Bessie, right? She leaves him anyway, too. So everyone leaves Bill at the same moment. She she leaves to get back with Nelson. And they hop the border to Kentucky and they get married. By the way, everyone in this story is like getting married and getting divorced and like it's, it's very complicated. But the point <laughs> is that she... <laughs> I'm not. I'm not explaining all the detail. It's just I have pages of notes in front of me. Yeah, um, re- read a book. <laughs> yeah, read a book. No, uh, she leaves and she goes to Kentucky and she gets married. But of course, the next year, Bessie comes back to Bill, right? And this time, it was such a long absence, and there was a real marriage to Nelson and everything. Bill's like, "All right, I'm leaving my wife. Like, we're gonna do this for real. You know, I'm I'm Team Bessie now." <laughs> So he ditches Carolyn and his kids at the farm. His kids are getting old now. Uh, and he would still, like, send money and he would visit the family. I mean, he wasn't a great dad, but he was he still existed. He didn't never come back. Mm-hmm. Um, but if the kids ever did come on tour or Carolyn came on tour with the kids, they wouldn't bring Bessie, right? They'd leave her in Nashville. And that was a big deal because when Bill would play, like, the Grand Ole Opry or something and, like, Carolyn and the kids would come, You know, if they went backstage and they saw Bessie, there was a couple times that, like, fist fights broke out. Genuine fights broke out between, you know, Bill Monroe's family and his lovers and all that. Oh. Yeah. So anyway. I'm sure that didn't leave an impression on (laughs) young James Monroe (laughs) as he was standing there watching that. Oh, my God. Uh, The cycle continues. Here's a little little twisty twist, though. Um, So now that Bessie and Bill are together, uh, no matter who they're married to, because Bill's not divorced yet, right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, there's another woman joining Bill on tour and that is the daughter he had with Bessie in Georgia depending on how this story is told the the love child of Bessie Lee and Bill Monroe is the little Georgia Rose but I've heard the weird thing about that is that I've heard from other people that like someone else is the little Georgia I think there might be multiple little Georgia Roses is what I'm saying (laughs) Uh, yeah, I've I've also heard these like counter arguments. I think Richard Smith maybe puts forward the child narrative in the Can't You Hear Me Callin book, or at least hints at that. But I've definitely heard like eh, maybe Georgia Rose was yeah, maybe Bill promised that tune to a few a few people. <laughs> I think he did. Yeah, yeah. You can you can look that up too. You can find like more instances of that for sure. Um, I've seen that argument happen. <laughs> So, right, of course, you know, this goes back and forth. You know, Bessie leaves Bill. Bill tries to get her back. Blah, 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 right? And, of course, you know, and when Bessie talks about this later on, she's like, oh, my marriage with Nelson was ruined by Bill and his meddling. And I'm like, well, I mean, it takes two to tango and all that. Like, you know, I wish I could just side with you, Bessie, and be like, yeah, Bill's the worst here, but, like, you had a hand in ruining your own marriage too. <laughs> you, exactly. It doesn't just happen to you. <laughs> no, it's it's we're back to this white black narrative thing. You know what I mean? There's no like. No, binary no one's clean here. In, yeah. yeah. Anyway, Bessie and Bill end up together for good in like 1951. Then Bill gets in this terrible car accident. This car accident they always talk about. I'm sure you remember. If you've never heard about this, it's insane. Bill and Bessie are in the car together, and I think the driver in the oncoming traffic is like drifting into their lane and bill doesn't really have like a shoulder to get over to or something they it's a head-on collision though yeah bill monroe breaks 19 bones he forces his own car door open he goes around to bessie's side he pulls her out of the car and he carries her to the road with 19 broken bones (laughs) bill monroe (laughs) he is a manly man if nothing else oh 
yeah, not the only instance or or anecdote that will support that <laughs> fact, but yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, he he obviously cared about her because that stuff happened. But in in 1960, Bill finally gets his divorce papers from Carolyn. This is where the story gets interesting. If it wasn't already interesting to you, this is my favorite part. <laughs> Um, he gets his divorce papers from Carolyn, even though they've been separated for a long time. And she blabs all about this wild situation, rightly so, and is like, I can't remember all the language she used, but, you know, Bill has uh, had, like, repeated negligent behavior and stuff. You know, she's kind of brutal in her description of this whole thing. She makes a lot of it public. The court finds Bill guilty of uh, adultery and, you know, abuse or something. And the judge rules that the defendant, William S. Monroe, is enjoined from marrying Bessie during the life of the petitioner, Carolyn Monroe. So Bill isn't allowed to marry Bessie until Carolyn dies. And that's legal. Yeah. I never heard, or I don't remember that fact. That kills me, dude. Oh. So what does Bill do? He doesn't tell Bessie. <laughs> <laughs> so he avoids telling Bessie. So he avoids, yeah. But, like, Bill finally gets this divorce, and, like, you know, if what he's been telling Bessie is true, like, oh, I, I want to be with you, I want to marry you and stuff, and he's just found out legally he cannot marry her until Carolyn dies, which is just wow. brutal. I mean, I, always around, that's brutal. Uh, a striking blow from Carolyn. Well done. Eventually, Bill tells Bessie, hey, you're not touring with the boys anymore. You know, we're going to hire other people. And Bessie's kind of putting it together like, oh, no, I've invested so much money and time and effort into Bill's career, and I have, like, nothing to show for it. Some of my money is, like, in the bus or, like, in Bean Blossom or wherever, and, like, none of those things have my name on them. I'm not even like on the deed to any of this stuff, right? Oh. And and she's now becoming the housewife. Someone else is going to take her spot out on the road, you know. And yeah, she's like putting yeah, it all being together. Rotated out. Yeah. Oh. And uh, so yeah, then the, the next mistresses are named Virginia and Hazel, which I don't remember as well at all. Bessie's the cool one, right? Bill never marries Bessie because he's legally forbidden to do it. Bessie files for divorce anyway. She <laughs> she goes to the courts and is like, I would like to divorce my husband. And they're like, there's no marriage license or anything. And she's like, well, we traveled through a lot of states that recognize common law marriage. So surely our marriage is recognized. And uh, and it works. And she yeah, her document is just like, we operated as man and wife. And I had no knowledge that Bill was legally forbidden to marry me. So converted to today's money, she gets a settlement of half a million dollars. So it's a win for Bessie. Could have been a bigger win, but still a win. But yeah, that's the story of the Carolina Songbird. Seems like the boys might be wrapping this one up. You two mind breaking the fourth wall and telling the folks where they can find you online? Yeah, I'm Marcel. You can find me at lessonswithmarcel.com or on the Lessons with Marcel YouTube channel. Lots of content about bluegrass guitar and how to play it. What about you, Hayes? You can find me at HayesGriffin.com or on YouTube at Hayes Griffin. Easy. Also, lots of bluegrass guitar educational type thingies. <laughs> we'll see you all later. You have a good one. Mm -hmm.